Well, my editing skills are crap. But can the same thing be said about Ant-Man? Stick around and find out. I don't know. What would ant music sound like? All right. So I just saw Ant-Man this morning. Um, I'm Peter Franson, by the way, from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. And this is my uncut review of Marvel's Ant-Man. Um, so the synopsis here is that the there was once an old Ant-Man who was out of the public eye, uh, who was operating maybe somewhere in the 60s through the 80s, somewhere in there, and he retired to keep the tech, that the shrinking tech that he invented uh, that allows people and objects to be shrunk down to like ant size. Uh, he retired and took his technology with him to keep that tech from being appropriated by the military um, and uh, put into mass production and incorporated into wars and things like that. His company is now led by a, a bad guy uh, who wants to do that now. And so Hank Pym needs a thief to steal the tech that he created and keep it from being militarized. Uh, so that then you enter uh, Scott Lang, who's a burglar on parole with a daughter that he wants to uh, be a father to, wants to be in her life, and uh, he wants to clean up his life, but Hank Pym wants to recruit him, and that complicates things. And so, of course, then adventure and comedy ensue after that, etc., etc. Uh, so let me talk about the just the, the, the story, the script, that kind of thing. The plot itself is not really engaging. Um, it doesn't really have major twists and turns. The villain isn't fully formed or very complex. He's a very forgettable villain to me. Um, the suit that he wears eventually is cool and so like what he can do you know during the 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 back third of the movie you know is cool uh but the character himself is you know they, they i think they tried to they kind of gave lip service you know in their efforts to kind of make him complex and uh relatable in any way um and he wasn't relatable, but the villains don't necessarily need to be. But at the same time, he wasn't this, you know, grandstanding, like really extreme type of villain that you don't need to relate to, but you enjoy them just because of how extreme they are. He really wasn't either of those things. Um, but the movie was a neat combination of superhero and heist movie. And I'm trying to think, I don't think we've seen that before. So that was cool to see, uh, you know, because the, the Ant-Man technology is all about shrinking down and being able to infiltrate places and get through security measures and stuff like that. And so... This was a neat combo of like uh, several heists and also super heroics, you know, throughout the movie. So uh, I enjoyed seeing that different kind of mashup of, of uh, story types. Um, there are some family subplot elements that I think help to uh, ground the, some portions of the movie emotionally. But your mileage, I think, is going to vary depending on your stage of life. There were certainly some elements in there that were about, you know, Scott's relationship and with his daughter and how much he loves her and wants to be involved in her life and stuff that if I would have watched before having kids, um, I would have like followed along and it wouldn't have been like eh, grown worthy or anything like that. But it wouldn't have had the it wouldn't have triggered the emotions that were triggered in me as I watched it this time. So, I mean, if you're not in the stage of life where you're uh, a parent, um, there's going to be some stuff that they put in this movie that really just aren't going to probably mean much to you. I don't know. It's, I think it's just really going to depend on kind of like what your relationship is like with your family and what stage of life you're in as well. Because uh, there's also some father-daughter, you know, with uh, Hank Pym and his daughter, Holly. There's some conflict there. And, you know, so, um, yeah, so I think the whole family stuff, I appreciated them putting it in there. And for me, it, it had an, an effect at some, some good moments that helped kind of ground the thing for me. But I think it's going to be very different depending on, you know, your life experience. Um, the tone is the same kind of action slash comedy tone that we've been seeing ever since Thor the Dark World, you know, where they're trying to, I feel like, um, keep that, you know, get that lightning back in the bottle that uh, that we had with the first Iron Man movie, which even the sub the subsequent Iron Man movies didn't quite recapture, even though I, I definitely laughed in both the second and especially the third one. Um, they never quite recaptured just the, the, the magic of that crazy humor comedy combo that was in the first Iron Man movie. Um, so, but I would say that if you laughed at the jokes in, say, Thor The Dark World and thought those were funny, um, then there's a good chance that you'll be laughing at 
these jokes too. Maybe even a better chance because I think Paul Rudd is just more suited to comedy than many of the uh, actors that are cast in a lot of these Marvel movies, which maybe are a little bit more suited to drama or action. But they're just they they just don't have a real sense of uh, of of uh, delivering comedy in the same way that someone like Paul Rudd does, who has made his career in comedy. You know. Um, and well, and I would say Robert Downey Jr., who also has done a, did a lot of comedy before doing Iron Man. But a lot of these other actors, they just don't have the background that these two actors do in comedy. Um, so, uh, but I should mention, you know, that my sense of humor, it takes an unusual kind of thing to make me laugh. I guess maybe I'm just jaded and bitter. I don't know. You can diagnose me however you want. Um, but I usually don't laugh at these Marvel movies. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I never laugh at them, in fact. Almost, well, very rarely do I laugh at them outside of the Iron Man flicks. Uh, and But I, I will say that in my theater, although it wasn't a, a packed theater, uh, there was very little you know, laughter throughout this entire movie. Uh, in fact, the only laughter that really stood out to me was toward the end, and it was the laughter of children in the theater. So I don't know what that says. Um, what I will say is that the, there are elements in the climax which is you know goes on for about you know 15 20 minutes or so that feel almost like a kids movie and you've seen in the trailers probably some of those elements that I'm talking about where they're dealing with these little microscopic people that are battling on top of Thomas the tank engine as he's going around the track you know so there were some gags related to children's toys and stuff like that that uh, um, that I felt really appealed to children and in fact they really seemed to be appealing to the children in the theater who were just laughing hysterically at some of those parts involving uh, Thomas um, but they were kind of like the only ones laughing in the theater, you know, so I don't know. Uh, okay, so like I said, the uh, we'll get on to the cast now. Um, Paul Rudd uh, is great as an everyman in a crazy situation, uh, but the material didn't bring his best to surface, though. I think that he definitely got the chuckles out of me that the movie had to offer for my tastes, um, but uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, man, just all the laughs per minute ratio is insane, you know. Um, Michael Douglas was appropriately cast, you know, as this kind of like, you know, elder statesman superhero kind of serious guy, um, but he wasn't very interesting. I would like to see... I don't know. I, I won't say anything more about that. But I didn't find him very, very interesting as a character. Um, Evangeline Lilly, Lilly uh, who you might recognize from Lost and a few other roles as she's been kind of making her way more into uh, uh, films, uh, it plays Hank Pym's daughter, Hope. And she was fine, but I think the, the character could have been more complexly written than it was. And that was disappointing. Um, and as I already said, I, f I felt like the villain um, was uh, just not... You know, underwritten, is that the phrase? I'm not sure. Anyway, stuns and visuals, let's talk about that. Okay, so plenty of CG ants that look like CG ants. Uh, they look good. And, you know, the texture quality keeps getting better and better, but for me, whenever I see something biological moving that's not a machine that's made of CG, it just stands out to me. Um, but, I mean, you know... It's uh, how often do we really look at ants super duper close up? So it's like, you know, we don't have our, in our common experience a lot to compare it to. So I think it's a little bit easier it was for me to suspend disbelief and just go along. Okay, this is what ants look like when they're really big or when you're really up close to them. Um, there was some shockingly great de-aging effects that were put on Michael Douglas in the opening scene, which takes place in 1989. And, I mean, if I wasn't looking at, like, you know, like comparison shots to like Michael Douglas in 1989 someone could probably tell me that this was filmed in 1989 I mean and as someone who is cursed with an eye to pick out CG I was really impressed with what they did to his face and I think that just I, I appreciate them uh, doing something like that which is not as ambitious as creating an entirely CG character because Hollywood to, for my eye isn't quite there yet they, they got really close with Terminator Genesis but they're not quite there yet to make a convincingly you know, uh, CG person, but they may have now come really close to mastering the art of de-aging somebody, which, gosh, who knows what that'll do for movies in the future, actors that are able to go back and, you know, reprise roles that they've done in the past and look exactly like they did before, or at least convincingly enough. I mean, yeah, it was really impressive. So much so that I was like missing plot elements that were being introduced. I was like, what am I looking at? This is amazing, you know? Uh, so that was cool. Uh, the shrunken environments look and move 
like CG. Um, but again, because I don't often look at things really up close, I was able to adapt for the most part and just kind of accept these environments as what I would see if I really stuck my nose into something uh, and uh, took a really close look. So the overall, the, the action, there was lots of cool action and stunts and CG and stuff. It was unremarkable to me, but it met the current quality standards. It wasn't pushing any boundaries. I don't feel like these Marvel movies do, um, but uh, but it was it was there. It was solid, you know. Um, there was, as far as like, are there any like philosophical, moral, spiritual issues that kind of popped out at me that might, you know, trigger some worthwhile thought or a conversation? Um, not really. There was a couple if I was really picking away. At one point, Hank Pym says to Scott, I think every person deserves another shot at redemption. And his suggestion there is that Scott can, through his actions, redeem himself. And this is true in really every, um, uh, religious system that I can possibly think of, except for Christianity, uh, because... Jesus redeems us. Uh, it's not because we're able to redeem ourselves and kind of make up for the bad things we've done. Uh, we just can't. Um, and uh, so it, it's just kind of like a, a reaffirmation of that very common idea that we can redeem ourselves. Um, and maybe we can in the eyes of other people, but in the eyes of the one who matters most, uh, we can't. Um, let's see, what else? There's also, I would say... Um, the idea presented, or like, let, let me put it this way, it's the Mrs. Doubtfire uh, effect <laughs> took hold of this movie. And what I mean by that is Mrs. Doubtfire was the first movie that I saw, maybe the first movie that ever did this, where um, reconciliation between divorced people was not upheld as the ideal. That like we said, okay, we're going to just settle for the fact that we're divorced. And and still pretend that we can have just as good of and as functional uh, of a family as we could were we to um, have a married version of the same thing, you know. Um, now, you know, I'm not saying that in all cases, like, a, a, you know, a, a marriage life is always going to, a married life is always going to be better, more comfortable and, and uh, less harmful to a child than, uh, than a divorced life. But I think all things being equal, it is far better to have a child raised in a married home and it is far better for a couple to stay married uh, than to than to be divorced and again I, I don't want to get in all that I know there are, I'm sure there are some exceptions coming to mind I'm saying all things being equal um, you know we I don't think we want to let go of that ideal and uh, there wasn't any you know kind of hint that that they were going to try and reconcile at the end of this movie she had a uh, another guy that was a fiance that caused some conflict and drama you know which for the plot was I guess interesting you know but uh, um, but anyway those those two things you know this this uh, self-redemption and then lowering the bar in terms of our ideal of what a family is um, those are so common in so many movies that they they didn't really stand out to me again I really kind of had to think well what in this movie would potentially you know and that's that's the that's the most I could find maybe there's something after you see the movie that sticks out to you I'd love to hear about that um, in summary if I were a time travel going back in time and talking to myself uh, I would say Peter uh, wait and buy this movie when it's used and cheap because it's one that you would want to maybe sit down and watch with your boys. Now, they're going to be bored at some parts of it, and you're going to be bored at some parts of it, but it's kind of like in this middle ground where both of you will be able to sit through it and get something out of it. I, I know that's not really high praise for a movie, but that's where I'm at with this one. Um, Marvel, I think, has mastered the art of not making bad movies. You know, I remember a time when, like, most superhero movies were bad or like it was 50-50 I mean, it's, and it just seemed like nobody knew how to not make a bad superhero movie and then Marvel came along and they really started consistently with different characters making these really solid superhero movies you know um, but very few of them especially after you know maybe the first few that were really great you know I, I, you can pick and choose which ones you think those are um, very few are like truly great movies, you know. Uh, a lot of them, they're just like not bad. They're good, solid movies, but they are not. Uh, they haven't figured out how to make great movies. Now they've made Marvel's made some great movies, but I say they haven't figured it out because the movies that they make that are truly great seem to happen almost by accident, and then all the wrong things are given credit for their success and then overdone in the movies that follow. And of course, the humor certainly comes to mind, but I think there are other elements as well, and just kind of like the style in general 
general in which in the way these movies are told they're not told in like they all kind of look the same in the way kind of like they're shot to my eye there's not really any kind of creative like different camera work or or you know different types of storytelling that, that are really going on in these movies they all kind of feel the same and so at the end of the movie you know at the end of the day i kind of look at ant-man and say yep well here's a, another marvel movie so if you've been liking these marvel movies and you're not sick of them yet go watch this one you'll probably enjoy it um but i mean the the, the scary thing there is if you're a big superhero fan and want to see superhero movies continue is if they don't innovate, if they don't start allowing um, more diversity in their creative direction of these movies, people are eventually going to, I think, burn out. And they will confusedly think to themselves, oh, I'm tired of superhero movies, when in fact they're just tired of this ki kind of superhero movie. Um, and so I'm afraid that superhero movies will eventually fall out of favor with the public and they'll stop being made for a long time because people will burn out and attribute it to the wrong things. Um, so I understand that this movie started with a different director who departed due to creative differences, departed, was fired, not sure of the story there, but I can't help but wonder if these movies would be better if they would allow their directors to diversify tone and try new things, offering a slightly uh, more unique lens through which to view this universe uh, with each movie as it comes out. Um, now, I loved Man of Steel, um, but I don't want Suicide Squad to feel like Man of Steel. Um, you know, it, they should be able to kind of coexist. It's a, it's a fine line to walk, and I don't have the answers on how they should pull this off, you know, or how they can pull this off. But I think it's what they need to figure out in order for these movies to really uh, last in the long run. Um, they got to figure out how to, in these different universes marvel and dc both need to figure out how to make great creative unique decisions in each of these movies and at the same time have some kind of common ground that will hold to hold them together currently i think marvel is requiring it looks like they're requiring their directors to have too much in common with previous films and i would like to see them diversify their tone and their storytelling uh, a little bit this one's rated pg-13 for sci-fi action and violence all right, those are my thoughts. I'd love to get yours in the comments below. Please do like, share, and subscribe. That helps me out um, if you like this movie and want to share it and, and want more videos like this one. And then I hope you go over to, boom, ChristianGeekCentral.com and join some other geeks there as we continue to geek out and seek the truth.